I am joined today on the podcast by Kian. Kian Tracy, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Emma. I appreciate it. So Kian is the founder and CEO of Sustainable Choice. Um, and we will, I'm sure, get into the detail of what Sustainable Choice is later in the, uh, later in the conversation. But it would be great, um, Kian, if you could give us an overview of your career history and, and kind of your experience to date. Sure, no worries. Uh, well, I am, as you said, the founder and CEO of Sustainable Choice. That is only two years young. Uh, by trade, I am a media and marketing strategist. I've been in marketing since I was at uni. So I was working full time and studying you know, also full-time. I don't know how I did that. It's crazy. Uni, uni times are crazy, right? Um, uh, I started out working in an insurance company and uh, I was just in the contact centre and I sort of was, an opportunity came up to work as a marketing coordinator for that business while I was at uni. So I jumped at the chance and uh, I was actually studying a PR degree at the time. And because I started working in a marketing role, I realised how much I loved it. Mm. And I, um, I ended up changing my degree very near the end. So it ended up being a double degree in oh. both comms and marketing. And I found myself working in marketing roles ever since. So I, I started pretty young in leadership roles, taking on leadership roles for uh, a childcare, uh, not a childcare company, a childcare and nursery products company. So mm -hmm. a, a business that sells and resells um, prams and cots and toys, etc. Then I went into a few contract roles in the motor space and uh, financial services as well. And then I found myself landing in a role at Dodo. And that was sort yeah, of at cool. the time, yeah. that was my, that was my dream job. I was really excited about it. Amazing uh, leader that brought me into the business that I got to learn from big company, the, the right size business, the right fun kind of brand. And so I think, you know, really cutting my teeth in the marketing industry in that business was uh, a hugely fortunate opportunity for me. And I grabbed it with two hands and I really loved it. And I grew in that role quite substantially over the space of five or six years from a more junior marketing role into the general manager of the consumer marketing division by the time I was 30. So that was a, a really rapid, exciting yeah. growth. I think- um, Baptism of fire probably. <laughs> absolutely it was. I think some people are often ask me like, how did you do it so young? And I said, I think I, I think I was, older because I worked so many hours trying to you know race I was racing mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know why I was racing I think I always wanted to get to the next role as quickly as possible and and climb the ladder as quickly as possible and do exciting things and um that was and I loved that I really loved that role I had a team in Melbourne and a team in the Philippines and spent quite a bit of time between the two and growing obviously um a brand that Aussies know and love. Hmm. It was an absolute joy and I loved every minute of it. And when that came to an end, I was planning on doing what everybody says they're going to do, which is to take three to six months off and do some soul searching. <laughs> but the, and, and, and I had a pretty substantial uh, financial position at the time. So I was okay to take that time, hmm. but the terror of not knowing what's on the other side prohibited me from taking that time. So I started looking for a job. And how, um, how long did you last? Um, probably a week. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I had a proper <laughs> week off. So I had, a, I had a full week off. And then I went to New Zealand to see my brother the following week on my second full week off. And when I landed on the Monday, I started making calls to recruiters because I was panicking. Yeah. I don't know what I was panicking about, but I, I'd say back then it was pretty warranted because there wasn't a lot of roles and I'd come out of being blissfully in love with my job mm. and you can't go into just any job when you've no. been in love with your job yeah so I went looking for something that was a bit of a unicorn and, and I wasn't sure if it existed and decided that I would freelance which I'd never done before mm. I didn't have an ABN or anything like that I was mm. a, a company girl my whole life I thought I always would be it was always my plan to be a company yeah. girl in fact, I used to say, verbally would say out loud, I am not entrepreneurial. 
I will always How work for the man. Yeah. I, will, I will always be more comfortable working for the man. Yeah. And I actually, and even that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable that I said that, but it's true. Those are the words that came out of my yeah. mouth. And um, I decided to start freelancing. I had a few opportunities came up, got my ABN sorted. And all Where of did a sudden, that decision come from? What, like what's switched uh, in your head to kind of I, think, oh, I, I might work for myself. <laughs> yeah, it was a really, it was, okay. So I was working in a role, in a contract role. And they, I said, you don't really need me here full time. They said, no, but would you be willing to, to work for us part time mm. until you, until you, you know, find your next role? And I thought, oh, that's not a bad idea. So I started working two days a week as a part time CMO. And I was really effective and it was really helpful and they didn't have to pay me a full CMO salary. Mm. And I thought, geez, there's something in this. Yeah. Um, and presumably and, they were an SME and, and didn't have the scale for. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I was working with some, some people who uh, have since become uh, friends and, and colleagues in that they have become my web developers, but I was chatting with the web developers who were in that business mm. at the time. And they said, well, why don't you start your own business? And I said, oh, don't be silly. That's, <laughs> I don't do things like that. It's just not me. It's not my style. What would I do? What would I, what would, like, what would I do? Mm. And they said, you, well, you just think of something, just try. Why don't you go, go make one phone call and see, you know, try something. So I, yeah. I, I got in the car and I made a phone call. I called somebody in the industry and I said, hey, I've got an idea. I said, I think I'd like to start up my own consultancy where I'm a part-time CMO, mm. where I can give small businesses the, the leadership and strategy of a CMO without the price. What do you yeah. think? And he said to me, do you know what? I don't think, I, it doesn't sound like a good idea. Let me sit on it. I said, all right, cool. Your advice, I, I value your advice. And he called me the next day and he said, hey, I was just working with somebody and they really need somebody to help them <laughs> do A, B, and C. And I've given yeah. them your number. And I took his call the next day and the rest is history. I started my business with that a couple of days later. And that was from that one referral. And then I got another referral and then I got another yeah. referral. And I was at capacity pretty quickly. I was, I'd never been happier. Mm. I'd never loved my work more. I'd never been more flexible. I'd never earned more, more money. Mm. I just thought, wow, this was, you know, it, it had, it was, I think it's like short-term blissful because you do get to the point where the loneliness kicks in, like that yeah. flexibility of I work for myself, I can go where I want, I can do what I want. That's amazing. Mm. When you don't, when you're going to other people's Christmas parties and you, yeah, you don't, you're never going to your yeah. own Christmas party. Yeah, you haven't got um, your own team you around You don't have your you. own people yeah. and, and, you know, I was a freelancer basically that, didn't know that co-working spaces existed, my goodness me. So I found myself in cafes and pubs and mm. random places all the time and it just didn't feel, I didn't feel grounded. Mm. Um, I didn't feel grounded, but I loved it. So it was yeah. okay. I could find my way around. And that's and, probably quite an interesting reflection, isn't it? Because then you you kind of start to pick out the bits that you like and the bits that you don't. And I think that sometimes often in hindsight, but is, is quite a useful exercise because I think it's quite hard when you say to people, what do you want to do? Or tell me about your perfect job. It's quite a big question. But if you kind of pull it down and go, well, I, I love flexibility was great. I got to work across a variety of projects. That was great. Didn't have a team of people around me. Didn't like that so much. Didn't have a, you know, and you can kind of work through aspects of it. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I don't think I've ever reflected on it like that, to be honest with you. I And I don't think that had I been asked that question prior to embarking on that experience mm. I don't think I would have articulated those same needs and wants mm. I think they would have been very different and I'm I guess I'm glad now that I had that opportunity yeah to go out and, and see what I wanted to do I learned a hell of a lot I think the most rewarding thing was that I was very very effective mm. I made substantial contributions to the businesses that I worked with substantial mm. tangible contributions that really changed the business and I was able to identify what I was really good at mm. and when you're uh, in in a leadership role in a really big business with a really big team 
that is so challenging and you tend to become a little bit of a HR department when you're the head of a 40 person mm-hmm. team inevitably there is is questions and conflict etc that you need to learn how to manage uh, and I am ever so grateful for that opportunity and experience but you're not really a marketer no you're quite now. removed aren't you at that point yeah so I got my hands dirty again and I really got into the marketing and went into businesses that had marketing teams or didn't have marketing teams so mm-hmm. I would be a leader a leader one day and the next day I would be the marketing coordinator and the next day I'd be the media buyer mm. and I loved it and I was able to make a difference for people and that when you can really see the difference is so rewarding and reminds you you know it reminds you that you've got capabilities and skills that yeah. sometimes imposter syndrome can get in the way of or just life and busy and team and people that maybe don't necessarily think that you're right for the job that you're mm. in and all of a sudden that can really weigh down on you whether or not yeah. you start questioning yourself whereas when it was just me out there with my clients and they were thanking me saying you've changed my business mm. I didn't need to question myself as much or or it didn't need to weigh down on me and yeah. that was really really nice and I would never have dreamed in a million years that I'd be sitting here saying to you that I went out and you know if there's a there's a bit of a saying in the in the industry it's like oh she's gone out on her own it's people that have worked in big media organizations and they realize it's easier to go out and freelance and do it on their own they're like oh yep she's gone out on her own and and that was said about me oh yeah she's mm. gone out on her own but it wasn't my intention Hmm. It was never my intention to go out on my own. You know? <laughs> it was my intention to be the CMO of ANZ one day. That was the hmm. dream job, you know, hmm. to, to, to climb the ranks of a big bank. Yeah. And I am so glad that I got to see other things because no matter what happens now, chasing the big job at a bank will never be what I plan to do. Hmm. So that's good to know. Now I know. It's Yeah, it's such a big shift as well, isn't it? I mean, you know, totally things change um, over the years and, you know, you try something and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And you might, you know, hone and refine. But such a big shift of, you know, uh, being the, ma- the working for the man, as you said, and, you know, being a company girl, wanting to work in a big bank to starting a startup. You know, but it's such a shift. It's really interesting. And I think what happened when I was about six months into KT marketing, people would often say to me, so what's the plan? Are Mm. you going to grow it? Are you going to remain on your own? Are you going to go and work for your biggest client full time? Because that was always an option. Mm. And I said to everybody for the first time, I'm going to say this for the first time in my life, since I was probably six or seven years old, I don't know what my plans are. And Mm. I'm just going to sit in this and do this without any plans to grow, scale, change, nothing. I love mm. what I'm doing. I'm going to t- turn off the, the pressure for two years. For two years, I'm going to stop demanding of myself to know what's next because I really just I started to believe that landing in that position that I was in, landing in my own marketing agency, I realized that but planning was not necessarily as important as trusting the process. Mm. And it sounds a little bit airy fairy, but I was in a position to trust the process. Mm. I was in a very solid position. I was getting paid well to do a job that I loved to do that could scale if I needed to. Mm. And I thought, I'm just going to take the pressure off for a moment. I don't think I want to scale a marketing agency. I don't think that's who I want to be. I'm pretty confident that's not who I want to be, Um, but I'm not sure. So I'm just going to stop telling myself that I need to know what's next and wait and trust that that I'll find it. Mm. And I did. And that's quite a big shift from um, what you were saying before of, you know, getting off the plane in New Zealand and you only managed a week and then the panic kind of set in of what's next, what's next, have to have the plan, have to have the plan to it's okay I, I I don't have one and that's okay that's totally a massive out shift of character. yeah I'm totally out of character like I said since I was six or seven years old I always mm. had a plan 
And when I was six or seven years old, I always wanted to be a shopkeeper and work as a checkout chief. Yeah. And I did that when I was 15 years old and I went and fulfilled that dream. I've always known what I wanted mm. to do and what I was working towards. At the very least, I knew what I was working towards. Yeah. And right then and there, I stopped trying to figure out what I was working towards just for a moment and trusted myself that yeah. I was smart and capable and that people would support me and everything was going to be okay and I could find it. Did it and feel liberating or scary or it just was? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it was liberating because mm. I'm very, very type A personality that is supremely organised and knows exactly what will happen at every minute of the day. And so I don't feel I was liberated by it. I mm. think I, what I was trying to do was to get the burden off my back of other people thinking that I should grow the marketing agency mm. because gut feel, I didn't want to work in a marketing agency. Mm. And there was two pieces of advice that I've been given over the last few years that, I mean, millions of pieces of advice, but two that really stuck to me. One of them was somebody that used to work for me. I was having lunch with him and I told him, oh, you know, I'm killing it. I'm having so much fun, never earned so much money, blah, blah, blah. And he said, yeah, but you're really exchanging your time for money right now. He said, he said you know you've made it when you make money in your sleep. And I thought, oh, that burned. Here I am telling you <laughs> going. Yeah. And, and it made me realise that, yes, I am at capacity of exchanging mm. my time for money at the moment. And when my time runs out, that's all I've got. So that one, that one sat with me and another one was that somebody said to me, I was, she was talking to me about how much impact I'd had on one of my clients' businesses and how much I'd grown it and how amazing it was in market, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, don't you ever get tired of making rich men richer? And don't you ever want to use your powers to make yourself richer? Don't you ever want to use those, those skills to work for yourself? And that hit me like a ton of bricks too, because mm. here I am, you know, going and doing all of these things that I'm very skilled at doing. And it never occurred to me once that maybe I could be doing that for myself mm. in my own business and growing my own business. And so those were a few things that really stuck to me that made me feel like maybe a marketing agency might not be where I belong. Maybe it mm. is. I wasn't sure. I just wasn't yeah. sure. I just yeah. needed that time. So the, the very, very long way to the answer of, no, I wasn't liberated at all, but I was giving myself space and giving getting people off my back. I let people think I was liberated by it mm. so that they would be like, oh, yeah, cool, back off, stop yeah. asking. <laughs> uh, but I really, I really was just, there was a small part of me that thought if I can land here without trying if this if this something this good can happen without me intending it to hmm. if I just keep working really hard and doing the right thing by people perhaps that will happen again interesting yeah it's a it's just such an interesting shift because I think so often and certainly you know other guests that we've had on uh, in the sort of entrepreneurial space it's it's kind of always been there for them they always wanted to they always knew often grew up in a entrepreneurial household and it, it was just kind of always part of who they were and it's so interesting to to hear the exact opposite of that of I, I, it literally never occurred to me and actually I wanted the complete opposite end of the spectrum and um yeah, just a, yeah, really interesting to, to hear the other the other side. It is. It's really strange, actually, because being in startup land, mm. which I also didn't intend to be in startup land, I intended to start a business mm. and then found myself in tech startup land because what I was building was something that should be globalised mm. like, a, like a Silicon Valley style tech startup. Yeah. But that's not what I thought I was going to land in. I thought mm. I was going to build a healthy Australian-based business. So that's where I started. And again, even once I'd become entrepreneurial and then I started meeting founders, you know, like yeah. startup founders and realising that they've dedicated their lives to trying to think of the magical idea. So they mm. were always going to own and run a business. They just didn't know what it was going to be yet. Mm. Mine was the polar opposite. Mine yeah. was came across an amazing idea that I had the guts to chase and here I am but no I wasn't looking for my big idea mm. I wasn't I wasn't and they, they're studied right so a lot of these people have have 
built connections for 10 years straight out of uni. They started mm. building connections in startup land and all these things that I didn't know existed. So I look like a, a sort of a, a strange alien in the space because I did everything in reverse. I built the business very differently. And, and it's to my detriment in a lot of ways to, to, be, to be not the person who was studying how to be a, a, a fast scaling tech startup mm. because there's a lot of people that have lived and breathed it and always have lived and breathed it and studied it and, and introduced themselves to all of the right people and been to all of the right conferences yeah. for 10 years in a row. So I keep, I keep finding myself being the person who's the opposite of everybody else. Yeah. It's interesting though, because I think the best businesses are based on trying to solve a genuine problem. And often I think when that happens organically, that the person sees a problem and, and actually thinks of a solution to that problem, they're often the ones that tend to, in the long run, be the most sustainable as opposed to, I'm an entrepreneur, I want to start up a business, I just need to think of a good idea. Um, well, do you know fingers what I mean? crossed. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it's going to work in my favour that yeah. it, it went that way. But uh, tell us a bit about yeah. Tell us a bit about the business and and how and how you came to that idea. What what problem um, you were trying to solve? Yeah, I'd love to. I um I was working with one of my KT marketing clients who was going through a environmental transformation of their business, a twenty year old business, but ready to start looking under the covers to see how they can uh, reduce their environmental impact and mapped out a journey a roadmap to that and we had conversations about how do we communicate this with the clients and I was asked you know let's do a big campaign let's tell everybody what we're doing and I said do you know what it's just a little bit risky to do a campaign because your audience potentially will crucify you if you haven't done enough or if you're not ready or mm -hmm. if you can't deliver to any of the commitments that you've made in your campaign then you're screwed so we need to be careful. We need to make sure we understand our environmental impact really clearly before we start boasting that we're doing better. So I said, leave it with me. Let me have a think. There must be a way we can communicate this. I'm just not sure what's best. So I sat down and I started looking for what I assumed would be a comparison site or some sort of networking site that helps you to find information about sustainability and what businesses are doing. And that's where we would communicate this story. Yeah. And I couldn't find one. I thought, mm. there's nothing. There's lots of little marketplaces where you can buy, you know, keep cups and bamboo toothbrushes and those types of things. Lots of great marketplaces, ones that mm. I shop in, by the way. But that's not what I was looking for. I was mm. looking for something for mass market brands where you could find information on mass market brands about their environmental impact. And it didn't exist. And I just had this moment and this, this, what I'm, what I'm, the way I'm telling it will take a few minutes to describe it, but this happened in the space of about 45 seconds, mm. this thought process. And I thought, geez, maybe it doesn't exist yet. So I went to godaddy.com and I typed in two or three different domain names and I typed in sustainable choice and it, and it was available and it was mm. outrageously expensive, but it was available. And I thought, do you know what? I think I, I think my, I found my calling. Mm. So I got my credit card out and I, bought the domain name on the spot and I went home and reflected and I sat down and I started writing a brand strategy the next day and 70 pages later I wow. was like okay I think I know what I'm going to do <laughs> so I called my developers the three gentlemen that said to me a few years earlier why don't you start your own business mm. and I called them and I said hey I've got an idea come with me on this journey so we sat down and and I, an hour after I sort of shared that brand strategy with them, they said, all right, let's go, let's do this. So we embarked on building sustainable choice, which uh, as far as the brand strategy goes and who we want to be and how we want to do it and what we want to be to the people and how we want to be honest and transparent, every word of that 70 page document still stands true today. The actual technology, how we were going to build it, what we were going to build has become substantially more sophisticated over the last two years substantially more so than what I wrote in the original hmm. document. But who do we want to be and what impact do we want to have has not changed one bit. And the idea of this platform is that it houses the sustainability credentials of the world's brands, the big brands, the mass market brands, no matter what stage of their journey they're at, 
If you want to buy a mattress or a pair of shoes or a tin of tuna in your day-to-day shopping, and you'd just like to understand more about the environmental impact of the brands that you love already, that you're going Mm. to shop with anyway, you've got somewhere you can go to find that information. It it all lives in a single digital destination. Much like if you were buying a house, you would go to realestate.com. Or if you were looking for a job, you would go to seek. The idea of this is that you've got a go-to platform that you know you can find what you're looking for. Or if you're looking at something in a supermarket and you're reading the back of the label and it says, this product is certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. And you think, well, what does that mean? Is that a legitimate thing? I know, I'll visit Sustainable Choice. I'll quickly type this in and see if there's any information on that and whether or not it's a certification or the brand has just made up something. (laughs) Turns out that's a certification. And so this platform that we've built, it's, it's designed to be that home of that information. And you just, you can always rely on it. You can always go there and read things brand by brand Mm. rather than saying, what does this mean? Or how do you dispose of a pair of shoes? Yeah. You go to our website and you can look at how do you dispose of this brand's pair of shoes? Because this brand might say, Hey, the upper part is completely plant-based and you can put it here. The sole needs to be recycled at this place. So brand by brand, you can get specific information about the products. So we built it. <laughs> it's very cool. I love that kind of 45 second realization of, wow, I, I think this is, I think this is it. I think this is the idea. You, you touched on it earlier and um, I just thought of it again as, as you were speaking there, that the space you're in is very much a, that tech driven startup space. Mm-hmm. And you're you're not a developer you're a marketer so presumably this is more of a marketing driven startup than a tech driven startup have you do you think do you feel that and and have you I guess come across any challenges or or benefits from from being that way focused as opposed to it just being about the technology uh the answer to the initial question is, is do I feel it's more marketing-led than technology today? Mm. Absolutely, yes. Mm. The answer to that is yes. And the challenges are that I don't want it to be. So the idea is that we built it for the brands first. We could have built it for the users first, but the mm. problem would have been we, we wouldn't have had any brand content on there. Mm. So I had to think through the lens of a brand marketer and what information they'd they'd need to communicate and how they'd like to structure it and how they'd like to utilise this tool. So that it was led from a brand and marketing perspective to get us to where we are today. It's not going to be forever. Mm. What's happening in the sustainability space right now is that everybody wants you to know which product to buy, which one's the best. You want to know which one's the best. But there are thousands of scientists all over the world right now trying to help you figure out which one is the best and they haven't solved that mystery yet and they are conflicting in their opinions on that at the moment. Mm. So over the next five to ten years, the level of sophistication in scientific data around sustainability and environmental impact, that's going to grow day by day by day. The idea is that our platform will become more and more sophisticated with that data. So we will not be developing that data. What we would like to be is the aggregators of that Mm. data. So we will pull from all of the different data sources around uh, emissions tracking and reporting software or scoring uh, scoring technology like a B Corp or Invato or something like that where there are different scores coming in for different types of environmental and social impact. But there's lots of different ones, right? Mm. So that information remains fragmented right now. Mm. And so if there are lots of different ways to record and report on your emissions or your net zero targets, et cetera, they're all fragmented all over the internet. The only place this information lives is on your website or the website of the tech company that's building the tool that you're using. Mm. So you'd have to go searching through all of these things. The idea is that we say, here's all of the companies that are have made their commitment to net zero targets. Here they are. And here's all the different tracking tools that they're using. And we we aggregate that data Mm. and we bring it in and we use sophisticated technology to be able to provide provide 
answers to the questions that are suited to the people that are looking for it. And mm -hmm. as time goes on and we can get more and more data points and more and more sophisticated data, we are able to potentially start telling, telling people what actually ranks better than another thing. Yeah. It's very, very challenging science to do. And most of the organisations that are doing it now are doing it in different ways. So apples and apples is, is, is so, so hard yeah. to do right now right now, but it's going to get better. I mean, there are mandates coming in. In Europe, there are already mm. um, government mandates coming in around what you have to say and where how you have to be scored. That will happen. That will happen in Australia too. And when it does, when that's ready, and people go, okay, cool, now there's rules. Well, where does that information live? We'll yeah. be ready. We'll be ready to have that information there. So it will turn into more of a technology-based platform. Mm -hmm. But right now we wanted to build something that was suitable for today yeah. and suitable for the businesses that would use it. And we understand that the people that are challenged most by the environmental story are the marketers. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are risking saying what they're doing and being accused of greenwashing mm -hmm. or not saying anything and potentially green hushing because they're afraid <laughs> that if they haven't done enough, yeah. then they can't tell you anything at all. So this is designed to support marketers. Mm. Give them a platform to communicate. Here's the journey. Here's the roadmap. This is how far down the roadmap we are. Mm. These are the things we're doing. Here is the one product that we've made way better than the rest. Mm. Now, in some circumstances, you might have, you know, the court of public opinion is crucifying this brand because they've only got one really solid product. The rest of them are a little bit behind on the environmental mark. But we're saying, you know what, you've got one. Show the people, this is the one. If you want to have the, the least environmental impact, buy this one. And we're mm. saying we're trying to embrace change and embrace the journey because the alternative is we just go bashing all of the marketers for everything they say. They're afraid to say anything and we make no progress. So, Yes, it will be a technology platform, but right now this is for the marketers. Mm. And as you said, you know, your your customer, your initial customer is a marketer. So I think just that, you know, you are a marketer, you can talk marketing as opposed to I'm a developer and, and you're trying to have this kind of apples and oranges conversation. Um, mm. I'd imagine that's really, really helpful that they know that you understand what they're going through and, and what they're trying to communicate. I think they can see it when, when we're talking to them about what mm. tools are available to them. Like, oh, that's handy. Well, that's great. Can we use that? Mm. Like, yes, we built that for you. We built that because we understand what your challenges are. We built it so that you can go in and edit and add, remove, delete, upload at the touch of a button because we know how hard it is to get dev time from, the, you know, getting somebody to design a web page getting somebody to develop a web page, yeah. getting it through all of the legal approvals and pushing it live and then going through all the bugs and checking them and getting it fixed. The processes of building a web page to tell this story and get it to your customers or get it shared internally is excruciating if you yeah. have to build a website. I know mm -hmm. what it's like. I've built many, many, many websites in my time. So we made it so you don't need to build a website. Anybody who's got access to the internet and a keyboard can go in here and add, remove, edit, and upload content, and it'll still look slick because we've made it so that that will happen every time. Mm. So you don't need to be a developer to do this. And you can, you know, we think it sits really well in sort of like the social media team of the marketing mm. department. So that team that's managing content on third-party yeah. platforms, they can come in and say, oh, we've just done this great post on Facebook about our new plant-based product. Here's where we can go and upload the video and the content about that product and it can live always on sustainable choice yeah. great perfect so we we were thinking about the marketers what they need to do how easy we need to make it for them and also the sustainability people because they're in a lot of the time they're in a new job if you went through linkedin yeah. and did everyone who's got sustainability in their title chances are 65 70 percent of them are in their role less than two years mm. and so they're, they're not having a massive impact on the bottom line right now. They're, a lot of businesses bring in this role grudgingly yeah. and they're, they're fighting against the senior leadership saying, we yeah. need to do something, we need to do something. Yeah. They're fighting the marketing team for dollars, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying, let's make it really inexpensive and really easy to use. And then the, the person in the sustainability team, they can say, hey, guys, do a blast out internally and say, hey, here's some, um, an update on what I've been doing. 
and they can upload all that content onto our platform. So they don't need to ask the marketing team for time to use graphic designers and web mm. developers. And so they're going to, that the marketing team will love them even more for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, not getting up, they're not getting up in their way. They're not, they're not demanding dollars and time from them because mm. we make it really easy and inexpensive. How, and you mentioned before uh, you're a founder and, and out in these kind of tech circles with, with other founders. My assumption is, correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of those other tech founders would be men or the percentage would be quite high. How, how have you found it as a, as a female entrepreneur uh, leading a, a business like this? What's your experience been? Uh, it's an interesting question. The, I'm so, I've been so used to it. So I, I come from telco, so that I was often one or two of, one of two women mm. amongst 10 or 12 people at any given time and I guess I'm really quite used to it I think I think it's much harder to be taken seriously in startup land it is so hard it is so hard to be taken seriously for not having been one of those people that's been attending every conference mm. for the last 10 years trying to get noticed because I didn't know that that's what you needed to do. So firstly, I'm out of the inner circle. And secondly, I'm not a, you know, a, a person who looks like your average tech startup founder. Mm. And so, yeah, I think it's hugely challenging. I mean, statistically, the amount of, funding that that in startup land that goes to female founded businesses is minute in Mm -hmm. comparison now I think there's a big bearing on that in that there's probably a lot fewer of us building tech startups that want to grow through venture-backed capital etc um so yes that would be a reflection on that but I think the actual dollars that land into the, the hands of the businesses that are founded by women it's terrifying, actually, when you know you want to grow and you've got an amazing business that's already operating. Mm. And yet, if you were a hotshot young dude who, you know, was willing to get out on Twitter and tell everybody that you're amazing and people will throw <laughs> money at you. Yes, it's hugely challenging. It's always been a challenge. And I think that something I learned about being a woman in a man's world is that we tend to we tend to do most harm to other women in that space because Mm. I found that a few things I found that there's only if you know there's one seat for a woman and you're in it it's very hard to encourage other women to try and get in get to the table Mm. because you're terrified they're going to take the one seat I often thought like why do all the boys that I work with they get to be mates like they're mates They, they play golf on the weekends and yet they are all level and I can't like I don't have female friends at the table with me. And I think I realise that it's because there's so many spaces, they may as well bring their mates with them. Yeah. Whereas when there's so few seats that you think are okay for a woman to take, you're like, well, I can't bring my friends because what happens if they take my seat? Mm. And that's something I've been able to work on over time. I think my role here, and I've always been a feminist, however, it's hard to be a feminist with a voice because you lose. You lose if you start talking about being a woman. Mm. So my way to be a feminist is by hiring great women and educating great woman, women and, and promoting great women and sharing with them what I have and giving them great roles and putting them out into the stratosphere as part mm. of my business. That's the best way that I can play the feminist role mm. because complaining about being the only woman in the room or complaining about yeah. how people treat the women in the room doesn't get you anywhere no it's and you know I actually had somebody call me recently and say do you do you think there's still inequality with women or do you think that's gone now and I was (laughs) I was like what (laughs) I said I'm one of the lucky ones that was able to sit at that table and Yes, there's yes, there's huge inequalities. I mean, there's statistical inequalities yeah. that you look at on paper, but just you know the opportunities and the people that you know people that have didn't like 
something that I said or did mm. and forever would never work with me again. Whereas, you know, if you're in the boys club, you can make mistake after mistake after mistake and keep, you know, keep getting yeah. getting promoted. And I know I've gone off on a rant here because this is actually not relative to tech startup land. It's actually not a misogynistic space. It's mm. just drowning in men. I come mm. from misogynistic spaces, mm. uh, but but both are equally scary for different reasons because you actually have to just work twice as hard Mm -hmm. and I know I know going to be a a tech founder in this space I have no choice I either have to work twice as hard and accept twice as many rejections or I have to get out and not do it Mm. but you've got to pick one so I've decided to accept the rejections and work twice as hard that's fine. That's my position. And maybe the next generation won't have to do that. And the reason I can do that is because the generation before me fought on my behalf. Hmm. So yeah, I'm, I find it, I find it, I'm conscious of it, but it's very different to coming from a space where you feel like, you know, the boys club, I don't feel like I'm in a boys Hmm. club when in the founder space, they certainly don't behave that way. Hmm. Very different, more modern view but there's just not many of us. Yeah. There's just not many of us. And sub- and I think it's all subconscious bias. Mm-hmm. I don't think in the tech space people are going, oh, she's a woman. She doesn't, I, don't, I think she's not going to be able to handle the jokes. I think it's more, it's more, they just, they can't see it. You just don't mm-hmm. look the part. You don't yeah. look the part. So I've, I've seen, you mentioned, I, I don't remember them off the top of my head either, but you mentioned the statistics on the amount of money that goes to feet. I've seen those and it's incredibly low, as you say. Um, and I wonder if it's it's maybe that's part of it of uh, do you get seen do you get do you get into those conversations if you're in those conversations and they're choosing between a number of businesses more than likely the person making that choice is a man are they are they subconsciously as you said that subconscious bias of oh you know I'm not sure about I'm not sure about this business over here but this guy seems really confident I'll I'll go with him um there's just so many layers of it aren't there there's so many layers and I actually think it's it goes back to you know little girls dressing up as nurses and little boys dressing up as doctors you know mm. when, we're, when we're coming up do we see ourselves in that role and mm. I always said that I was going to work for the man, right? Mm. I've got friends who probably don't have as as much of the skills that I have to run a business but have been serially entrepreneurial and successful because Mm. they just keep fighting for it, you know, they just keep going. And I never thought of myself as being able to do that. I just thought that's a boy's job Mm. subconsciously. And I grew up, and the reason that I have, founded this business is because I started by consulting and that's where I first learned how to get an ABN and to what is GST and all that sort of stuff and so once you know that you can start a business then you think okay I can start any business if you can do this one you can do that one I've already got the next five in my head now but most people will have a daily thought of wouldn't it be good if this existed But in their head, and I've done that my whole life, wouldn't it be good if this existed? Hmm. It never occurred to me to start that business. Now, every single day that I think that, I go and I buy a domain name and I sit Hmm. on it and I'm just like, when I get around to that, I've got the name ready to go. So it's a different way of thinking. And if you're not raised to believe that you can be that person, Mm -hmm. and if you don't look like Mark Zuckerberg, then people don't expect you to be a founder of a tech startup yeah it's really interesting isn't it I was having this conversation um actually in a previous um podcast episode with Ez my business partner saying um we both listen to the um Stephen Bartlett podcast diary of a CEO which if you don't listen to it it's amazing but one of the things he often says is exactly what you've just said there it's what is the difference because so many people have ideas and lots of people have great ideas but what's the difference between the person that has the great idea and does something about it and the person who has the great idea and doesn't do anything about it? And it's it's that, I don't know what that is. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it in their psychological makeup? I don't know. But it's it's that thing that I think is so interesting. Um, 
And I do wonder, you know, that example you just gave there with the doctors and nurses, you know, is that is that generationally subconsciously kind of in there of, um, well, I've got this idea, but I can't start a business like who wants, you know, who would want who would be interested in, in my business? I, I don't know. There's so many layers to it. But I just well, even now you, in conversation, you, you think about names that you know like Jeff Bezos or Mark Mm. Zuckerberg or Elon Musk Mm. right they all look like they look the part that you would imagine if somebody talked to you about somebody that was a tech founder you know like that's just it's just not something that little girls probably are thinking about and a lot of founders come from the space from a technology and development Mm. background as well again not something that probably now is very different I've got young nieces and nephews who are living in a very different world. Yeah, I think it's shifting, isn't it? But it's it, it but will take my a couple gener- of generations. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And and it's our responsibility in our generation to make sure that we pave the way so that they, you know, they see what it looks like. There's a couple of movies that they're really cheesy movies and I don't know why I love them so much, but there's a couple of movies that I really love and I'll watch them over and over and over again. And um, one of them is... Uh, it's the intern with Anne mm. Hathaway. Yeah, and I, I quite like that movie. I don't know too. why I love it. It's such a cheesy <laughs> movie, but I would watch it over and over and over again. And I realized that there's this young female founder that mm. is, you know, doing life and running a business and making mistakes and all of those things. And I was like, actually, there's not a lot of movies where the where as a woman in that role, maybe that's mm. why I'm connected to it. Um, and I must say, as much as I can talk all day about, about being a female in a man's world, et cetera, I'm also uh, acutely aware of the fact that I am a straight, white, able-bodied woman uh, that comes from a, a, a middle-class family and that I am very, very lucky in, in the way that I landed on this earth and that there are plenty of people who are severely underrepresented more so than myself so this is the tip of the iceberg it's the only conversation I can have because it's the only one I'm familiar with but I couldn't even imagine how much further this conversation goes to other people Mm. in in minority situations or suppressed situations so Mm. I just want to acknowledge that that because I can't I can get caught up talking about being a woman it's really not that hard (laughs) (laughs) um my final question, Cam, which is always my final question, a um, bit of a reflective one. Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? I thought about this uh, last week, you know, what do you know now? I, this is going to sound really cheesy. <laughs> what I learned over the last couple of years is trusting the process and trusting myself. And I'm not even sure that learning that any earlier would have been better. Mm. So I think the only thing I would say is that I don't have any regrets. Yes, if I had a time machine, there'd be some things I would change. But I wouldn't wish for a time machine, I don't mm. think. I don't, I don't think there's anything huge that I know now. Probably like if I had a time machine, it would be all about buying the right shares, to be honest. <laughs> That's where I'd be focusing. But... <laughs> I I think I have respect for the fact that it has taken me time to learn things and that they came Mm. at the right time and it's actually okay that I didn't know things then and to forgive myself for what I didn't know and not to look back on things and go, God, I wish I knew that then. I actually don't have anything huge that I would want to send back to my younger self, maybe maybe really just that that trusting that if I keep doing the things that I believe in, working hard, I don't expect everybody to believe in that. Like it's not for everybody to work the way that I work and I don't demand it of anybody. But for me, keep working the way that you love to work, keep learning, keep being really nice to people, keep being generous and trust the process and trust that if you keep putting everything in the right place, that, that creates opportunities. And, you know, and I will say luck, but luck comes because you've lined up all of your opportunities perfectly at the exact right space and time. So when that luck comes along, you can grab it. So that's probably 
that's probably as close as I would get yeah. is just to saying to just keep being me and trusting me and forgiving me for my flaws and not wishing too much that I want to go back and tell myself something to be honest I don't think I would I love that answer thank you very much okay. and, <laughs> and thank you for your time that was um as the title says that was a really interesting conversation and thank you for uh, yeah just being open and honest about your your journey and and the things that you've experienced and really appreciate you taking the time well thank you for inviting me I really appreciate it I think it's it's really lovely and, and flattering to to be involved in something like this and to be able to talk a little bit about the journey and how we got mm. here so and I've really really enjoyed chatting with you and <laughs> you, you know opening up my heart so thank you <laughs> so much and I really appreciate it it's been great great chatting you're very welcome tell, tell, tell.